thank you. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Lorenzo Giambagli for a second lecture. Please, Lorenzo, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I will start with a little bit wrap up from the last lesson. I will um, uh, argument a little bit more on the MSE, which was something we just rushed in at the end of the uh, last lesson. And then we will uh, try to hopefully understand why deep neural network are needed sometimes like in, in nowadays uh, AI tasks. And uh, uh, I hope that I will try to convince, uh, that, that I will be able to convince you that deep neural network have exactly like the very, very nice property that we can exploit and uh, in order to learn difficult tasks, like for example, oh. text, uh, like for example, uh, sorry? Oh. Yeah, there was, uh, for no, example, no, no. Like, uh, uh, like natural language processing or very advanced image classification and so on and so forth. So let's start with what, what, uh, to what we, from where we left the other uh, the last lesson. And if, I mean, if you remember, we have basically introduced the data set. We have introduced the log function. We have introduced the hypothesis space. And all together, those two things will be inside a learning algorithm, which in turn will give us a function f. So, for example, if we want to classify images of cats and dogs, those data sets will be the list, the, the set containing couples or tuples of cats and the label cat or and dogs and the label dog. And this will be something that will be uh, fed inside our learning algorithm, which will look for the proper function in H that is capable of uh, somehow achieving this task, so of completing this task. And what does completing this task mean? Basically means that the, the algorithm will try to minimize some kind of loss. So it will look for function in the hypothesis space and uh, it will try to minimize the loss function. The loss function that we have constructed, we have it has been constructed using uh, some kind of statistical principles. We have used the maximum likelihood principle. We have been, we have also said that we could also have used the uh, kullback libel divergence or the cross entropy. Um, of the cost entropy and it, it would have been basically the same so now that we have everything we, our learning algorithm will basically try to minimize our loss function with respect to the parameters that we have used to describe our hypothesis space so our set of function we are looking our function in and at the end of this process it will give us a function f which can be basically written as k of the hypothesis space the loss function and the loss now, we ended up with, with, with a question, and the question was, how can we evaluate the performance of the, of the output of this algorithm? And the, what the, the, the thing we, we really do care, uh, we really do care about is basically the expected value over the whole distribution of the data, which is something we cannot access, of the expected value of the distribution of data sets, I will argument this later, of what? Of F at B minus C. So if you remember, C was the target function. So we assume that there is like a proper function, a proper um, uh, deterministic function that generates our data, which if you remember basically accounts for saying that our G of Y given X is a delta of C minus C. Y, Q of S minus Y. And basically, we said that this, which was something that we define as MSE, is what we look for, what we care we, if we want to understand how our function performs. So let's now stop and understand why this is true. This is basically true because it says that there are two sources of, vari of variability. The first source of variability in the output of our learning algorithm is due to the fact that different data sets, so different sampling from the distribution of real data, will lead to different functions. And then another source of variability is basically the fact that, come on, like as soon as I have one function, okay, the performance of this function has to be uh, evaluated 
has to be um, somehow, yeah, has to be understood well in every possible point in my distribution. And this is the second part, so the expectation value over data. The thing is that what we really want to understand that, that, that those two expectation values together will account for everything somehow, and in the end will give us a number. And this number is on average, where the average is taken over all possible data sets and over all possible input data, um, how our function deviates from the true function, okay? What happens is that we can rewrite this. So if we define something like the expectation value over our data set D of F as the average F, so what I'm saying is I'm saying that I will have several data sets. So let, let me let me introduce like one, the first data set, which is a collection of P number of, of P, sorry, uh, X and Ys. The second data set, another collection of P, X and Y, different from the first one, and so on and so forth. Then I will compute for each one of them. Uh, um, the, I, I will evaluate my, my, my learning algorithm in each one of them, and I will extract my function F or hat of D for each of them. Then I will compute the average of this, and this will be our F bar. Okay. If we get, I mean, by defining that, we can rewrite this as a contribution of two, two things. Calculations are also in the notes. One, so from of the basically the expected value over D. What? Okay. Let me jump straight to the point of the point that we don't have time. Of the variance over D of our F hat plus the bias square of our F hat over of our F bar. What does the variance account for? The, the, the variance accounts for the variation with respect to the average. And the bias accounts for so more or less this is the idea here, and the bias accounts for the variation with respect to of, of the other with, with respect to the proper target bar. So those two those two terms here are what I have to average over the proper distribution of data in order to obtain my MS. Okay, so maybe maybe this will be. Hi, hi, Lorenzo. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Daniel from uh, Brazil. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for uh, these talks and for following up on this uh, theme on the bias and various no decomposition from last time. I remember that was the last thing you showed last time. Um, I found very interesting the way you presented this. I was wondering, uh, I actually had two questions that were follow-ups to uh, your previous talk. One is uh, uh, on the uh, assumptions that we need in order to make this decomposition, because I know that, for instance, for a linear regression, right, uh, we have this decomposition, uh, which uh, uh, goes very nicely. Uh, and uh, I found very interesting that you presented this in a very general setting. I think it's way beyond uh, linear regression. Yes, um, exactly. It is way beyond. Actually, there is a lot of, how can I say, confusion in literature because sometimes it's not very clear whether you are talking about a estimator or a model. The idea here is that you have a model, so a generic output from this learning algorithm. And you really want to have some kind of scalar that tells you how well it performs. So our our, our assumption actually very very general. The thing is that we were the first is that we basically are able to get a, a yeah we are kind of trying to remove all the stochasticity in the learning algorithm. So let's to fix the ideas. Let's assume that our learning algorithm is somehow 
once you have the data set it will it will give you the proper function so in this setting here to me it's pretty easy to want to, to how can i say it? it's easier to understand what happened so what happens is that you have your data set and in turn you will have your learning your, your function f of t then you can do this on another one and another one and another one and so on and so forth until you have a collection of functions now there are two things you can evaluate the first one is the performance of each of them on the whole set of possible inputs and this is something that you will do evaluating what is, is called the test loss or by basically evaluating your f of d on data she that, that are, has not that, that have not been used to train your model and then you compute the average of, of this result for every one of these and if you do this you can get a proper estimate of the MSD. so what i'm trying to, to do here is somehow something uh, i would say very theoretical in the sense that in real world you will never be able to proper evaluate this msp but what i wanna what i wanna show is that inside this quantity there are two contributes one which is due to how much your um how much you are um, the output of your learning algorithm deviates from the average which is the variance there so how much basically your uh, learning algorithm somehow is dependent on the data you are giving in and then the other part is how much the best thing that you can do to estimate your proper function so the, the mean somehow inside of, of, of all the results deviates from the proper test function so somehow this okay. the bias square of course average and so on so those two terms actually are super important to me because they let you understand what's happening in the world of neural networks why because what we will see is that okay let me let, then i will uh, let you continue with the second answer but so that uh, i i'm in the in the flow so what we will see is that if I call this MSD, and if I, unfortunately, I need to use this small part of the platform because the proper webcam doesn't work, so I'm not in it. So the idea is the following. The idea is that if you are able to compute this, the, the, the scalar I mentioned, for whatever model you want, not, not, not just the linear one, right? whatever model you want, and you are assuming that the square loss is the proper one which is something that of course there are there has been a lot of criticism on some uh, on some i would say uh, context because maybe it's not always the case so here what we are trying to do is basically understand the idea behind it but of course might be that the proper scholar you want to evaluate is not the square loss somehow but still if it is the square loss the idea is that how will we compute this thing here, we will we will basically run the learning algorithm on our data set di somehow, and we will obtain f, we will obtain f of the i. Then we will use this to estimate somehow the expectation over the data of f of the y minus t square. And this is what usually is called a risk defect loss. Okay, so a data set, learning algorithm, test loss. The test loss is evaluating this by estimating this expectation value using data that the, the model has not seen. So different from the from the one. So we will estimate basically by doing this, the sum of the J over the test j so that the, 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 uh, let me see on the test so it's only one I need to do probably with this and the thing is that you will evaluate this quantity here of d i minus t so uh, let me call the, the test set let me call it like should be tau here and uh, so m of x j so okay so well uh, x J belongs to the test set. We will evaluate this average somehow, and then we will do this for another PPC, so for another data set, and we will obtain another test loss. So after we have all of them, 
then we will do the average over the data set. So we average all of them out. I have one for each data set, and I will average them all. Then I will obtain a scalar, which is a point in this graph here, where here there is the, somehow the hypothesis space, the, the complexity of the hypothesis space. So let's assume that our hypothesis space has some kind of parameters that parameterizes complexity. Okay. Now, each of these points, of course, is something that I've obtained averaging my learning algorithm results after having run it over a given data set and then another one, another one, another one, test loss, average everything, I get one point here. As soon as you have one point here, I can change a little bit the complexity. So just a little bit, maybe instead of working with polynomials of order two, I will do with polynomials of order three. And then I will obtain another point and another point and another point and so on and so forth. But as we have, uh, as we have seen at the end of the, of the last lesson, and, that, and as I basically quickly wrote to you before, each of these points is the result of two theoretically different quantities, the bias and the, uh, and the variance. So what happens is that across this curve, there are two contributions, one that is getting larger, which is the bias, and one that is getting uh, smaller, which is the bias. So what does this mean? This means that by changing the complexity of the hypothesis space, so by enlarging my, my hypothesis space, two things will happen. Again, remember, each of these points average over data set and then average over the distribution and the same procedure that I told you before. We will have our hypothesis space. Let's assume that our hypothesis space is not that big, it's a small one. So let's, let, let's assume this is small, so even, even smaller, like graph number eight. Let, let's say something like that, a small one, okay? Then for each data set, I will have a result, which is, so I will do all those results here, and then inside my, my hypothesis space, I will have my best function, F, my, my average function, okay? So this is a very simple one, but- so yeah, a quick question. Yeah. It would be very far, likely. Okay. The true function will be very far from my hypothesis space. So the dominant term in the in how my algorithm performs will be the bias. Of course, if I have take a much larger hypothesis space, I will have that my best function will be very close to the proper true function. But I will have to account for a very large variance. And this is what happens when you are working with neural networks very often. Because why? Because very simple neural networks, like the one we will, I will be showing you in a moment, lie somehow here. So the linear regression is here. But very large networks are there. So neural networks are tools that are, have a Usually, I mean, of course, this is something that can be complicated a lot, especially due to like contemporary research where uh, also double descent curve and so on and so forth have been witnessed. So a lot, lot of very strange behaviors, but still the idea is that the more complex the model is, the higher the variance. So the, the, the different the result with respect to your data set will be. The smaller the model, so the simpler the model, the more stable the result, but the farther you will be from the true function. So neural networks somehow very often fall in this region. And it's very difficult to understand how to properly tune them. So there is a process that you can, uh, that you can but we will we, uh, talk about this problem, that I, this, about this process, the next lesson, where I'll be speaking about the optimization of neural network, that you can somehow try to understand to approximate the MFT with respect to the complexity of your function, so how many layers, how many nodes in your neural network, as we will tell uh, in a moment, in order to find the so-called optimal complexity, which is the one that you want because it's the one that performs better, okay? Usually, this part here is called the underfit region, and this part here is called the overfit region. So 
in this region here, your algorithm basically performs very well on your data set, but very poorly on your um, test set. So on the data here that it has never seen. So by averaging this out, you can somehow account for this variability, but still those two regions are some that you want to avoid when you are working with neural networks. Because believe me, that is super easy to fall inside this. If you take a very popular uh, classification data set, it's called CIPAR-10, which is a data set that basically classifies between 10 different things, like, like if I remember correctly, like boats and uh, dogs and uh, cats and so on. It's super easy to find ourselves in this region here. So usually in order to account for this problem, there are several techniques. One is the one I would, the, the, one is using a validation test, a validation set, which is an estimate of the MSE. Another one is basic the regularization, which is another technique you, I would hope I would be able to speak to you in the next lesson. But still, so this is basically the, 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 the picture, the general picture that you will always find when you want, when you have a learning algorithm, that, which means basically, Always that whenever you're using, you're doing machine learning, always have in mind this curve here. So in order to properly estimate, you need the test set, which are points that you have not used in your data set. Okay, and why you need that to estimate properly the average over the distribution of data. Okay, that that, that, that that's the that's more or less the idea. Okay, I don't know if you I think you had you had another question, or maybe I've already answered. I think you already answered, uh, but just to clarify, uh, so uh, you in this abstraction where you have multiple data sets, uh, you run the training algorithm for each data set, right? So you run multiple training uh, episodes. Exactly, exactly, okay. exactly. But this is a theoretical thing, of course. In, in reality, what you do is estimate this thing using just basically one data set there because of, of the fact that very often you, 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 you don't have access to uh, an, infin an infinite amount of data. So it's very rare that for you to be able to plot this function like correctly. If you're working with probabilistic models, like, I, like I've shown you, so in a, in a very simplified scenario where you know P of X and where you know P of Y given X, of course you can sample from this and um, estimate the performance of your algorithm. So this is something you, you can sometimes do and properly understand the contribution of the variance and of the bias, but very often you, you can't. Yeah, I think that would be a very nice uh, exercise, uh, for instance, to take from a bivariate Gaussian and uh, sample, uh, maybe uh, yeah, for the other students. I don't know if you wish to uh, have exercises in this uh, tutorial. Yeah, 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 of course. This uh, would be a nice. A lot of exercise on how to estimate this using, for example, a very common one is try to estimate the sinus function using uh, um, uh, linear, like constant functions or using uh, parabolas. And you will find that by fixing those two hypotheses space, just so in evaluating basically at a single point of this graph for the case of the um, parabola and for the case of the, the, the constant function, you will find that, I mean, maybe the constant function is a better hypothesis space for this problem. Okay, so I will give you, I will give you something to work on. Uh, later, I mean, ah, oh, nice. Uh, I think it would be nice, uh, even to in this exercise to quantify to reproduce this curve using uh, real data. I think, uh, yeah, like yeah. real data, I mean, synthetic data. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yes, I, think... I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very abstract thing, this unfortunately. And uh, I mean. I just wanted to mention it because I find it like a pity that in a course of introduction of, of deep learning, I, 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 I didn't mention this thing, but in order to do it properly, it would take like one hour just for this, for the MSE. So oh, yeah, I, it's, uh, I really, the exercise for sure. really yeah. interesting. And uh, I think it's very also a hot topic in the sense that as you mentioned, the double descent, uh, uh, elements and is uh, uh, not very well understood, right? Uh, behaviors. Uh, so, so when you show these, uh, people may think, ah, oh, this is a very established field. But even for these uh, 
uh, behavior, there are still right uh, some open questions, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, assuming that this kind of let's let, let me let me somehow end this more abstract part, and now let, let's delve into the these neural networks. So, I, as we will see, the concept I more or less introduced will become very handy in uh, in the individual lectures, and so. What's, what's the problem in using like in real world data? The problem in real world data is basically that the number of configuration that you have, it's huge. For example, let's take an image, which is an image that is like 28 times 28. And let's assume that each pixel can be just a zero or a one, okay? So the number of possible configuration of something like that will be basically Two, this is the, the D, because each one can be either zero or one. And this number is huge, okay? It's huge because if D is uh, 784, and I mean, it's very, very difficult for you to have a data set that has this dimension. Very difficult, usually, okay? So if you want to classify, something that is called the MNIST data set, which is something like what I've told you, that is made of 28 by 28 images, and you write down, like it, those are handwritten digits, so people wrote down like one, uh, one, or maybe like five, and so on and so forth, and the task was to discriminate, like to properly recognize those digits. You already, which is a super simple data set, you already encountered this weird problem. The total amount of configuration is super huge, but your data set is not as big. Like, for the, let's assume that you have, I don't know, 10,000 uh, 10, elements. So, the thing is that if you sample at random in this space, you will get noise. So, the, the real data are, not, are, like are, are very sparse in this, in, this, uh, in this vector space of. Two to the power of seven, uh, um, 784 configuration. Okay, so this is a very big problem. And it's a problem that it gets even worse when you work with images that are, for example, larger. Let, let's think about, for example, the image that your phone can capture. Those are super wide images. So this number gets extremely large. So what you want to find is a function that lives in this space that is super large, but you have very, very few points in this, in this, uh, in this thing here. The thing is that lots of algorithms lie on the fact, like um, on the idea that, I mean, the, the more conventional one, you, you, I'm sure you, you uh, are used to, lies on the, on, on the, on the following property. Basically, if two points, so this is an assumption that is very common. If two points, x1 and x2 are close, so somehow x2 is all equal to x1 plus epsilon, then usually we assume that f of x1 is almost equal to f of x2. So our we are um, so the function that the output of the output of, learning, of our learning algorithm will be basically almost the same if two points are close, where this closeness can be, for example, accounted for with the where it can be uh, inspected with I don't know a conventional scalar product or with another measure of, of, of similarity. So if this happens, then usually this is like the, the classical regime we are in. But with this assumption, unfortunately, is not enough. Is not enough, and because the, the the space you live in is huge, and so basically a, a very a very um, uh, interesting problem can be. I mean, an idea of uh, in order to understand this, like to me, it has been very very useful. Is that let's assume that you want to regress a function that is like a checkboard, and you have like few points around it, but you want to infer like the property of this function in the whole space. So you only have very few points here. Can you actually infer the proper function? Can you actually understand the proper functional form 
in the whole space is the temple from here. And the idea is that it's very tough to do something like that because if you only rely on the fact that your function is continuous, you won't be able to do this. So how can we solve a problem like this? The idea, which is the core idea of neural network, is that it is feasible to generalize in very huge spaces beyond the portion where our points live if we assume something regarding the probability distribution of the data. So we will assume, if we assume something regarding the P data of X, Y, which is something that we'll tell you in a second, then we are able of generalizing. That, 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 that's the idea. And there are also, I mean, uh, th there are also some more rigorous results on that in the sense that you can prove that actually hypothesis on P data will basically uh, enables you to, under, to, to generalize outside. So to, to, to find the proper function even outside of the, the place where your data lives in, which is a very typical problem in real world scenario, which is the assumption that we will, we will uh, uh, make. The assumption that we will make is that our points, so let's say our labels, our Y, are not like super at random, but are the consequence of a hierarchical, um, uh, of, 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 uh, of a superposition of hierarchical factors. That's the core idea. So we will say that in order to find the proper function, we will have to take into account first a set of uh, factors that we will call features. Then after that, another set of factors that are computed on top of the older one, and so on and so forth. So this hierarchical stack of feature is an assumption that we, uh, we, we, we make in, on our data. So how our data behave on something like that. And this is something that is also very, that has been very, very influenced by uh, biology. Because if you look at in a certain region of the brain, what you find is that there is some kind of hierarchy in the, uh, in the information process. So for example, there is the retina that sends information to another part of the brain, let's call it uh, lateral geniculate. And then there is this part here, which sends information to another part, let's call this part the primary visual cortex. And then there is another, this region which sends information to another thing, which is called the secondary visual cortex, and then the, the tertiary visual cortex, and so on and so forth. But the information at a certain at a certain level relies deeply on the information extracted at the level before. So how can we implement something like this? The idea that we can develop in order to implement this reasoning scheme is the following. The idea is that let's assume that we have our input x that we call this x uh, uh, zero. And this input is a vector. Let's assume that there is like the conventional star model. And we will collect a set of features. And the idea is that we will project this vector uh, along each one of these features to understand whether or not this region is present in the, in the input. So for example, if this, uh, uh, this feature for the first one is some that is zero everywhere and one here, this feature we un will understand which is, for example, this component of the vector. If there is another, another feature, maybe more difficult here, it will understand other thing about the input. So by stacking those things here, we will get a set of numbers and let me let me let me call each one of these features like W one I. So what I'm saying is that the first level is as, that I can use to extract information is A I. Let me call A I one because it's the first level equal to W one I scalar X zero. So AII1 will tell me how much of this feature is present in X. 
Now, let's assume that we have some of those features that are relevant and some of those features that are not relevant. So somehow we need to find some kind of filter to remove the features or the linear characteristics that are not present in our input. And so we will have somehow a filter. So the second step is that we will apply a nonlinear function to each one of our numbers. And this function here is needs to be something like that. So this function here, so sigma, should be a nonlinear function that can be, for example, zero below a certain point, and then the identity. Or it can be something that is like the hyperbolic tangent, or it can be something like a sigmoid function. So there are several filters somehow you come up, you can come up with which does the job which will do the job and um, the thing is that as soon as you have extracted those features you will have somehow the new form of the input so the new component x1 i of the input will be how this um, uh, the input has been processed through this feature extraction and then filtering and so this concept of hierarchies of hierarchy, sorry, in, 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 in our understanding of the input can be accounted for by repeating the process. So what I will do is basically construct something that it will be like X on level K J will be something that is not a filter of lambda k j star x k minus one. So I will extract the feature, nonlinear filter, and so on. And then I will iterate this process. And this is exactly how a neural network, a deep neural network is built. So a deep neural network is built with the scheme I told you. Linear feature extracting, nonlinearity. Linear feature extracting, nonlinearity. And this hierarchy eventually will arrive in the output. So our output will be the result of all these feature extraction. How can we write down a function like that? There is a very uh, handy way, especially for people who work in network theory or in graph theory. That is basically the following. We will write down the linear function as an actor. We will arrive at the end of our output, and then here we will have our input. So, assuming that x, so the instance space, is a vector space, we can identify each component of our input, x0, i, with a node, with the, the so called activity on the input layer. Now, passing this information, so applying this feature extraction is something that we, that, that we can represent as a matrix and therefore as a, mm, somehow as a connection in a network. And indeed, if WJK is the feature that I want to extract, this operation here will, can be done by, as I told you, writing down a matrix which, has, which acts on X K minus one, and as a row w k j and it will return you a uh, a j j so this is exactly the same thing that i told you but written using the matrix format this thing here is called w k it's a matrix it's called the weight matrix and the weight matrix has a number of columns that is fixed by the number of components of xk minus one. So the number of precedent layer neurons, as we call them. And then it will have a number of rows, which are the number of the output of the, of the k layer, so neurons. So for example, if I have an input that has five components, and I want to extract 10 features, then the matrix will have 
5 by 10 will be 5 by 10. So 5, sorry. Yeah, usually it's going the other way. So the, the, if, if X has 5 elements, the number of columns will be 5, and the number of rows will be 10, because they will be going in a 10-dimensional space, because they want to extract 10 features. And then usually the nonlinear function is written as this. So it will be something applied component-wise, as I told you. Very often, you also let you to have another degree of flexibility, and this degree of flexibility is called bias. So you will not learn only that you, you will not only project across a vector, which is a feature, but you will also want to slide your filter. So you also want to understand from which value on filter. So you will add a B, J, K, that is called the bias of neuron J at layer K. This is something, of, of course, super general. You, will, you can find everywhere when you look at how neural networks are constructed, but I want you to think about them in this way. The linear part is the feature extraction at level K, and then you pass this later at layer K plus one and so on and so forth. And this is the assumption that we are doing on, our, on how to look our function in, on where to look our function in. So we will look at our function in a space that is the result of a hierarchical application of linear extraction and filtering. This is what I mean. So uh, could you explain again once more of BJ, how you, how you select this BJ, how it's constructed? Okay. For, for the moment, BJ are just a theoretical thing. I, I just want to have also this degree of freedom. This degree of freedom is called the bias. And the idea is that once you have extracted the, the, what I call the A, J, K in my formalism, then sigma of that is something that will cut it if it lies here, or sorry, that will let it pass if it lies if sigma is something that is like that. So the sigma is a function, for example, zero below zero and the identity for uh, x larger than zero for the sorry sigma of z is like that. This is called the red function, which stands for a rectified linear geometry. Then what what's happening is that this is z, which in my case would be a j up to here k. And then in your y-axis, you will have, I mean, if I live this in this way, if aj is larger than zero, it will pass. If aj is more than zero, it will be down. I also want a degree of freedom on where to put this filter. So maybe I want to cut below another, another, another value. And this value is called for it, it is precisely minus bj. So this has like several meanings. So one, one is that the, the first thing I can tell you is that basically you can always remap bias into connection, but this is uh, so, but this may, may be something that, uh, that, that is not worth understanding very well. The idea is that you want to understand where the cutoff needs to be inserted because a priori you don't know which, which is the proper cutoff. So you also allow you allow, allow yourself to have this degree of freedom. And the very, the, the idea is based, you can also be um, under, understood from a biological perspective because somehow the amount, uh, like every neuron has a threshold and this threshold is something that depends, that, that can be tuned. And tune, tuning where this threshold in is, is something that is up to the bias. So this is something that I, I'm inserting. I'm saying, okay, I also want this degree of freedom because maybe the filter needs to be shifted, okay? Okay. So let's say for now, I just, I, I, it's, it's very common to add this, this thing. You will, I mean, if you wanna be very, very precise, Usually, like uh, we, we can also we can also state this in this way: if you fix your network without the bias, so I, I'm assuming that without the bias everything sounds good. Okay, you are restricting yourself to the function that I mean, when evaluated at zero, they will be zero, right? Because 
f of zero. So the whole, I mean, when this is zero, this will be zero. And if this is the case, then the sigma of zero is by definition zero. So then you will pass to the next layer a zero vector, which again, when multiplied by w, will be again zero. <laughs> and so again, due to the fact that you don't have biases, then it will also be zero, and so on and so forth. So if you're working in the space where by j are all set, I mean, our absent, you are restricting yourself to the, to the space of zero function, or of, of function that evaluates at zero with the zone you zero, which is something you don't want because usually it's not the case. So you can just add this and this solves the problem. Does it make sense in this way? Yes, yes. So, um, what I tried to okay now that I built this, this is the idea okay of extracting uh, of extracting features, hierarchical ones. I think that it also be very helpful to understand how this is something very useful, and this is something very useful because having this hierarchy is something that enables you some kind of real of, of abstraction. So in order to understand this, uh, we will ask ourselves um, a, a question. And the question is, I mean, how fast can I separate my input space? So more or less, what I want to, under, what, what I want to convey you now is that using this structure here, with very simple function, I can basically separate, I can, yeah, I, I, I can have, with, with, with very simple activation function at a certain level, so deep in the network, I will have very complex functional representation in the input space. And in order to understand this, let me simplify a lot the context by saying that sigma is a very weird filter. What I'm saying to you for this very weird filter basically also holds true for the filter that I told you before. So the, the one that is zero and then the identity. And so in order to understand properly what's happening, let's assume that sigma of z is equal to the absolute value of z. And let's see what's happening when you fix your input space to be R2. So my distance space is equal to R2. Okay. So what does it mean? Like it means that the input space will be two-dimensional. Here I will have x uh, zero one, and here I will have x zero two. So the first component and second component. Let's assume that they will map this in a two-dimensional space. So then the second layer will be that constituted by two neurons, okay? And let me fix the way as follows. So this will be a one and this will be a one. So very simple structure from the input to the output, okay? And then let's assume that here, what you are computing is like summing them together and then apply a function f here. What I want to show you is that using this progressive indentation of functions, so this, this hierarchical way of stacking, uh, info, of stacking um, information processing, what you get is that for a very, a very simple function here, will rebound on a very complex function. So what, what I'm saying is the following here, this is just the absolute value. And so what happening, what's happening in this case here, is that basically my weight space, so my weight matrix, sorry, W1 is, is just this. I hope that it makes sense for everybody. It's just the identity and just passing as it is the input to the first neuron or the, the first component to the first neuron in the second layer and the, or in the first layer, I usually scroll for this up from zero, but it really depends a lot on the formalism. So on the first hidden layer, as it's called, the Y hidden, because it's not the first one, but it's it, 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 it's neither the, the last one. And everything that is in between the first and the last layer is part of our network, it's called the hidden layer. So in our hidden layer, what we have is just a linear possible information as it is of our input. But then there is this absolute value. So what, what's happening here is that basically, 
we are mapping everything in laminar two in the first quadrant. So in this in this part here. So apply this the absolute value is something that can be seen somehow as folding the space because it identifies two regions which are the opposite with respect to the axis that we have been computing our absolute value uh, on. And so this first here, if this is x0, 1, and this is x0, 2, this first absolute value here will basically do the absolute value over x0, I mean, we will compute the absolute, the absolute value with respect to x1, and this we could be just with respect to x2. So I'm folding the space in this way. So I will identify those points here, and then I will identify those points here. And in the end, so in the first layer, so here, I will basically work, so this is something done by W1 and also by sigma. I will end up with just the first one. Okay? Now let's assume that I define now in, in this in this thing here. Let me define a function, and that is a function that goes from R two and gives you a, a scalar. Okay, and this and this function is, is something like that. Again, this is very somehow hand wavy, but I think it really conveys the, the idea on how why those things work very well. Let's assume that I have this function here one zero. Zero, one. So a very simple function that in this portion here of the first quadrant is one, then in this portion is zero, here is zero, and here is one. What's happening now? So with this very simple function here, let me understand what's happening as, as an, with, with respect to the input. And in order to do this, I just need to reverse this identification, which is something that can do very well, because I know what does what's happening now. And so the function in input space will be something like that. This is the first quadrant, so we have where we end up ended up in. But then we will have something like this. Because we have to put basically the symmetry as of all of that. And so this is the function that we have learned doing this way using this network here. So this network here is representing this function here. Which is very much like a chessboard. So it's basically saying that everything that lies here is a zero, and everything that lies here is a one, and so on and so forth. Okay, so using a basically two by two tessellation here, I've been capable of splitting in a lot more region my input space. And this is really thanks to this concatenation of activation. So this is what's really behind the, the, the idea of how why neural network works that well, because in real case a scenario, what you have is that you are not computing the symmetry, so you're not using the so-called the absolute value, but very often you're just dumping out. But you are also like um, doing something that is much more advanced than, than just this linear passing of information. You, you, are, you have lots of different ways, so lots of ways that are not zero. And so the thing is that you have basically lots of dilatation and lots of contraption and lots of uh, magnification, and then you are basically cutting regions, or if it's better for you, you can also think about it as somehow with the, with the absolute value. You are basically identifying lots of regions after having uh, shrink them or having expanded them. And this lets you a lot of flexibility because in the end, a very simple thing will rebound in a very complex thing in the input. So there is basically, this is one of the core idea behind how and why neural network can um, uh, generalize that well, even when they see very few points. Because, because this way of uh, hierarchical indentation of linear and nonlinear function, linear, feature extraction, non-linear one filters is basically at the core of a lot of real world data, okay? Another thing that is very important to understand is that not only this hierarchical way of constructing thing is very helpful for this reason, 
but also those, the, this way of representing functions, so applying very simple element-wise nonlinearities and linearities, is something that is that constructs uh, construct a universal approximator. What does this mean? This means that the function that we are describing using this formalism here is basically very general. And you can very fastly, um, you, you, you can, I mean, in the limit where you have lots of variables, lots of units, lots of uh, uh, neurons, so you're going in a very large uh, space, what you get is that you are capable of representing any kind of function. And there is a very simple way to me, at least, to understand also this thing here. So not only very difficult function can be represented very easily, but also what I try to prove now, more or less, of course, because uh, uh, otherwise it will take a lot, is that this way of representing function is capable of representing any kind of function. More specifically, it will be, it's capable of representing any Lebesgue measurable function. So. A way in which you can see this is the following. Let's assume that I have a very simple network, uh, basically of the, the, the one that I told you. So one single hidden layer and one, one input layer, one, sorry, one neuron in the input layer, one neuron in the output layer, and several neurons in the hidden layer. So what does this mean? This means that I am constructing something that is like that. So I will be passing information from one neuron to lots of them using a linear, uh, using a matrix. How is this matrix? This matrix is just something like that. So you get the input, and then you are completing the matrix product with one row, with, with, with one column. And then you get the rows. And then, I apply the nonlinear function, the output of this. And I will get another vector. And I will pass this vector, the last one, using a weight matrix that is like that. So I will do the scalar product. And this is the last part of the matrix. And on top of that, I can apply another nonlinear. Okay, so that's what's happening with, with something like that. Let me prove you, prove, I mean, I, again, hand waving me, so more or less, I, I, let, let me convince you, let's say, that using this way of representing function, I am very general, very general, because let's assume that I want to fit, I, I want to approximate a function that is like that. So this is my, test, my, my, my target function, of x, and this is x, a very general point. Can something like that represent this? The answer is yes. Sorry, there is a, a money in the chat. Oh, okay. So let me let me let me try to convince you that this is true. How can we approximate this? Actually, we can approximate every complex function if we have enough neurons in the hidden, in the hidden layer. This is something that is super profound. There are a lot of connection with uh, uh, reproducing kernel in their spaces. If you have never, if you have ever heard about this, there are lots of connection with, uh, um, uh, yeah, with, with basically non like scalar product on arbitrary dimensional spaces somehow. somehow. So it, it's a very profound thing, but for us, it would be, I hope, a trivial thing. The idea is the following, is that every path like this, so every set of two neurons in the hidden layer combined with, I mean, uh, yeah, if, if I only account for this passing of information here, this thing here would be a function that we call this, uh, this function, let me call this uh, little f of x. Okay, so this function f depends on those two 
it will be a function that like is basically the result of the application of those connections. Then a nonlinear is here, and then another application of all those two connections. And let's assume that here we have no fine, no nonlinear function. So here the last function is the identity. So we just have the last scalar product, and that's it. The thing is that this function f of x is a function that actually depends on, of course, that those two nodes. So let, let me um, label those two nodes with i and with i uh, and with j. So this would be indeed a function of f i j of x. Right? And I will try to, I will show you that we can always construct a bump function using two neurons like this. So we can always uh, approximate the function. We can always write down something like that. So we can always let this f i j of x to be something that looks like this. And so with other two, we can have another one. And then another one. And then another one. And then another one, and so on and so forth. So basically, what we can do is approximate by stacking together lots of those functions the behavior of any given function p. If I have enough points, of course. Okay, so and this is actually very easy to see. Very easy. I mean, uh, Lorenzo, uh, before I continue, how would you then pick uh, the right uh, peak? Uh, for each x, because for each pair of y, i, i, j, you have a different peak, right? As you mentioned. Yeah, but th this will be f i j for a given i j. Every for every different i j, I will have a different peak, and then they sum all of them together. So let, let, again, let me explain myself in a better way. Because then you will input an X and then you will need a strategy to uh, select, given this X, what is the right output, right? No, no, okay, no, no, that, 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 that's actually not the case because ah. when, I, when I do this, so let's assume that I have one, two, three, four, five, six neurons. What I will, will show you is that this part here, let me go to one and two, can be this function here, which is zero outside this. Then this here, B4, will be this function here, B4. So this other trace here will be F B4. And as you see, those two functions at the end, we get some. So the result here is nothing but f12 plus f, f12 of x plus f34 of x plus f56 of x. This is our neural network of x. So no matter where, where the input will, will, uh, will be, there will be a function that is non zero. And all the other will be zero. That's the idea, more or less. Um, yeah, I'm not totally sure if I got what is scalar and what is vector. Uh, X is a scalar or yes? Uh, X. F one two of X is a scalar. Is a scalar, right? Let me write down each one of those. Yeah, so I, let, let me move on with the with the somehow proof. So mm -hmm. each one, let, let's say, let's focus on F one two of X for example. F one two of X. The sigmoid function of W one. We have just one node here, so W one one times X plus B one, and this is this first this first part here. Now this will be multiplied. So plus multiplied by W2. So the this is W1, this will be W2, W2, let me call W2 1. So this is W 
the scalar in this case, because the input is a scalar, W1, 1, and this is W2, 1. So this connection here is W1, this is W2. Okay? Then there is this other portion here. So last W2, 2, sigma. W one one X plus sorry double one two X plus B one two. So here I'm here. And then after all of that, this is a linear thing. So let's okay, we just add the bike. So we don't have any other nonlinear sign. So plus B. This is what F12, so this single thing here, is. So all everything that you see in the blackboard here is a scalar. Why? Because the input is a scalar. So here, every one of these will be the component of somehow this single column matrix that computes the transfer of information from the, zero, the, the input data to the first one. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now that we have this way of writing our F12, the idea is very simple. Why the idea is very simple? Because let's assume that sigma is the following function. So sigma is a sigmoid function, as it's called. So sigma is a function that has this graph here. It's one half when z equals zero, it goes to zero, and then it moves up, and then it goes to one. I hope everyone will agree me on that. So that's the graph of this, this sigmoid function. So what's happening here? So what's happening here is that this first part here is a sigmoid function, right, of the input. For simplicity, let's put w1, 2 and w2, 2 equal 1. So we can safely remove those things here. And now I have enough degree of freedom to write down, let, let me do this graphically. So this first thing here is a function centered around minus D one one. And this other part here, so let me rewrite this. That's a, so. That's the function I'm trying to draw now. This part here is a function that a sigmoid function is centered here. And it will have basically when the, this value here will be equal to minus d2 to d1, it will pass from one half. Okay? And then it will saturate at one by construction. So this part here is a bump like that. It's not a bump, sorry, it's a step like that. This part here is another step I can always reverse. Why? By just it's the sign of this W21 that can reverse it. And so the result of this part here, of the sum of two, two, two sigmoid functions here, will be the sum of two sigmoid functions like that, whose um, inclination or whose steepness can be tuned using W1 and W2. So when I sum those two together, I will obtain something that is like that. 
is something that I mean, here I will add one, which is the continuation of that to zero, and here I will add one, which is the continuation of that to zero. So everything will be something that has as a ground zero. And so it will be something that has a, as a peak two. So this is something that we go we will uh, will basically be a bump. Oh, unfortunately, like that. It will be a bump function that it basically extends more or less from minus b one to minus b two. So from minus b one one to minus b one two, and it's something like that. And with the bias on the last layer, I can always like subtract this portion. And so I can always set this b one to minus one and shift it down. And so with this technique here, I can tune the steepness as much as I want and center this bump as much as I want, wherever I want. So the key idea is that with this constructing technique, we can develop a bump function. And the idea, the final idea is that if we have enough neurons, so in the limit of the number of neurons that goes to infinity, I can approximate arbitrarily well any function. This is a very, very uh, hand wavy proof of a very general theorem, which is called the universal representative theorem, universal representation theorem. And it's a theorem that tells you basically that, but with a very, very complex mathematics. It's a theorem by Saibenko, I think, and also others, because it has been uh, demonstrated for different kinds of nonlinearities. So not only this sigmoid here, but also the step function that I've already shown you. So the rel function, the one that is like that. It has also been de demonstrated not only for the infinite width limit, so when the number of neurons in the hidden layer goes to infinity, but also for the case of the, of the number of hidden layers that go to infinity. So the concept which that, that I want to pass, the, so the, 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 yeah, the, the, the idea that I want you to grasp is that with neural network, with deep neural network, there are two key ingredients. The first one is the capability of representing any kind of function with a single layer somehow. And the other key ingredient is the property that you can basically construct very, very complex functions using this concatenation of hierarchical features, which can be interpreted sometimes as a space folding. Okay, which is uh, also a very interesting result in, on the paper, I believe, of 2007. And so, by stacking together those two, those two, but by putting together those two ideas, neural networks are very powerful universal approximators. And so they can respond very well to real world scenarios like the one that I told you. So like the, the problem of finding out, uh, I don't know, the function that maps an image to the proper label, but when the image lives in a space- that Hi, the connection, uh, can you- Sorry? The connection uh, dropped for a bit. Sorry, the connection with? I'm not sure if it was my connection or everyone's connection, but I couldn't hear you for like oh, 20 okay. seconds, I guess. Last thing you heard? Now, and the last thing uh, I heard was that uh, uh, there was some uh, works that show that uh, uh, this applies yeah, and then the folding, yes. Okay, uh, yes. Yeah. Kind of space folding. This, this, uh, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So the the thing is that it's the interplay between those more or less. I mean, my, my level of intuition is that there is this interplay between those two factors, which gives neuron. I hope that I've been able to 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 convey you why they they are so powerful. And why they are so powerful? First of all, because they can represent any kind of function. And second, because the way they explore the function space is using these hierarchical, um, these hierarchical factors that are progressively extrapolated, extracted, is very efficient, okay? So those are the, the two key things I want you to focus on.
what we will find is that i mean i'm not there are lots of interpretation on how on how neural network works another one is that basically they using this progressive indentation of factors they arrive at the end in in, in a place where basically everything is very simple to 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 fit so this is another idea that i think it's worth mentioning another way in which you can understand why neural networks may well is the following and this is a very profound one i think so let's assume let's assume that we have a data set that is like that here is plus one here is zero so the, the value of the function is plus one inside this uh, region here so let, let's let's assume that we go from one to minus one and so this function here is something plus one here and zero there the thing is can you fit a fun so can you can you can you uh, discriminate so can you understand which is the value of this function by using a line a, a plane and the answer of course is not is no why why you cannot understand it because this thing here is not linearly separable so there is no plane that can cut this data set in two regions one with of zero and one of ones so ultimately remember the discrimination task i already told you the discrimination task i already told you so using the in the first lecture so where so where we have used our intuition and on the on statistics to build up the cross entropy function was that eventually the function we were regressing was the decision boundary so let's assume that the function we are regressing is a plane here no way that the decision boundary is a plane the decision boundary will be a plane in a case like that where the value of the function is zero on the left and one on the right here the decision boundary is really a plane so I uh, would have points that are zeros for the, the function evaluated on which would be zero. And there I have points that the function, the proper function evaluated on which would be one. So how can I extrapolate this, this? I mean, how can I understand which class? So which basically is the value of this function is it, that can be discrete. So either zero or one. And remember, this is precisely the context of classification. How can I understand this though? In order to understand this classification problem, I need to find the decision boundary. And if I look for a decision boundary that is a line, here I can solve this problem. Here I can not. How can I reason? I can reason in this scheme. I can somehow say, oh, let me let me turn on the slide. I can reason in this way. I can either, either look for a function that it's not a plane. Maybe it's a function that is like that. So it's, it's a, a loop function. And then I can try to approximate this decision boundary, which is that one in this classification problem. Why classification? Because remember, here the function is binary. And when the function is binary, it's a binary classification. So the decision boundary here can be looked for that. Or I can use another another idea, which is super interesting and profound. And the idea is the following: Let's assume that I map this two-dimensional space to this three-dimensional space. And the mapping is the following: I assign at each x, y, I so sorry, at each x1, x2, I will map this to x1, x2, e to the minus x1 plus x2 this one x1 square plus x2 square let's assume they do something like this which is and, and again i map the label consequently so if this is i the, the data element i it has its own y i which can be zero or one and i will map this to this and this will have y i the same y i which is the the, the uh, how does something like that looks Something like that looks like this. That this will be mapped into something that is this.
this is the zero, all those points will be lifted a little bit up. And all the others that go outside the region will be down. So what have I done? I basically lifted up in this space here. I lifted up the points that are on the center, and I basically let the, all the points that are outside this boundary here remain more or less down. Here, a plane can solve this problem because here. A plane can be the proper decision boundary, and it's the one that goes basically between the upper part and the lower part of this somehow Gaussian that I've used to change my, my, my data set. And this is a super profound concept. Why? Because I used a nonlinear function, okay, in order to make my data set linearly separable. So I've made my decision problem solved about using linear functions, applying a nonlinear transformation. And that's another key interpretation of neural network. The fact that we basically, by stacking together lots of layers, they find that so if I stack together lots of layers, and in the end I have a linear, a linear, just a linear function, I'm basically a linear discrimination. So I, I look for at least my F, which is the decision boundary. So if I schematize my boundary as a neural network, the neural network will behave like this. It will basically learn the nonlinear function phi of x that will make my data set linearly separable. And in the end, it will come. Okay, that's another interpretation. How can the network efficiently learn this nonlinear function? Due to the things that we have already said. So this is how I will stop here. And in the next lesson, we will try to address how can we train our functions that are written in the form of a neural network so that those tasks can be solved. So the problem with is uh, minimize the loss function. Okay, we will do this. We will minimize our loss function, looking for the space for functions in this space, in the space of neural network. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Here some... <laughs> Hi. Let's thank uh, Lorenzo. So uh, uh, and uh, let's stop here.